We finally reached the point in this tutorial where we can begin to talk about tensors. So what exactly is a tensor? A tensor is an object with a collection of vector and dual vector indices, each of which transform with the rules according to the space. Tensors can have any number of vector indices and any number of dual vector indices. We classify by the form PQ. A PQ tensor has P vector indices, or upper indices, and Q dual vector indices, or lower indices. Let's take a look at some of the things we've seen so far. We have vectors with one upper index, so we'll classify those as 1, 0 tensors. Dual vectors with one lower index can be classified as 0, 1 tensors. It follows, then, that the metric is classified as a 0, 2 tensor, and the inverse metric would be a 2, 0 tensor. Additionally, scalars, which have no indices at all, are classified as 0, 0 tensors. Notice that I haven't explicitly listed an arbitrary matrix on this list. Some people like to offhandedly say that a tensor is essentially a matrix, but that's not necessarily true. Some two-index tensors can be represented as matrices, but not all tensors can. Additionally, not all matrices are automatically tensors. In order to be considered a tensor, an object must transform according to the rules of the space. Not all matrices follow these transformation rules, so we can't naively classify all matrices as two-index tensors. Formally, we say that a tensor is a multilinear map from the space of vectors and dual vectors into the reals. Let's try to break down what this means by considering what we'll call a well-fed tensor. A well-fed tensor is a tensor where we feed each of the lower indices a vector and each of the upper indices a dual vector, such that all the indices, in this case gamma, beta, alpha, nu, and mu, are all contracted, and the resulting quantity is a scalar. However, we are not forced to do this with a tensor. We can also have things like what we'll call hungry tensors or overfed tensors that do not map to the reals, but instead map to other tensors. In this example of a hungry tensor, gamma, beta, and alpha are contracted indices, but some indices still remain. The net tensor here can be represented as W upper mu nu. We can also have overfed tensors with extra indices. Here, gamma, beta, alpha, nu, and mu are all contracted, plus we get an additional lower index theta, making the net tensor W lower theta. Notice that we don't have to contract every single index with its own individual vector. We can also have tensors like this, or like this. Here's a quick quiz to test your understanding. For each of the following, do two things. First, determine if it is a tensor. And second, if it is a tensor, classify it in the form PQ. Pause the video now and work each one out for yourself. Let's review the answers. We'll notice that this first object is in fact a tensor, with one contracted index, mu, and no free indices. The result is a scalar, or a 0, 0 tensor. Number two also is a tensor, with one contracted index, lambda, and three free indices, one upper and two lower. Thus, we say that this is a 1, 2 tensor. Number three may seem familiar. It's a transformation matrix that we've worked with before. But tensors must follow the transformation rules of a space. And we can recall from a previous lesson that we can only transform things that have all primed or all unprimed indices. So this object here is a transformation that acts on a tensor, but it is not a tensor itself. Based on that last question, number four may appear at first to also not be a tensor. But notice that the unprimed index lambda is a contracted index. So this net tensor only has one upper index. So we can actually say that all its indices are primed and it actually is a tensor. Specifically, we classify it as a one zero tensor.
Number five has all contracted indices. So we end up with a scalar or a zero, zero tensor. Number six looks very similar to five. But just because we have two upper and two lower indices, it doesn't automatically mean they're contracted. In this case, only mu is contracted, leaving an upper index lambda and a lower index nu. So we'll call this a 1-1 tensor. We talked briefly about tensors having to obey certain transformation rules, so let's address that now in more depth. How exactly do tensors transform? We'll begin by first looking at how vectors and dual vectors transform, and then extending those to tensor transformations. In a previous lesson, we learned that vectors transform via the following rule. So now how do we write the transformation law for a dual vector? We see that by writing out the equation and then filling in the indices as necessary, our transformation rule becomes v lower mu transforms to v lower mu prime via the rule v lower mu prime equals lambda lower mu prime upper mu times v lower mu. The next question we must ask is how are lambda lower mu prime upper mu and lambda upper mu prime lower mu related? Let's start by first defining this lambda upper mu prime lower mu the transformation used for vectors, as the matrix lambda. This transformation, we notice, gets us from an unprimed to a primed coordinate system. So it may be intuitive that lambda upper mu lower mu prime, which instead gets us from a primed to an unprimed coordinate system, is equal to lambda inverse, as it is the inverse operation. To determine the form of lambda lower mu prime upper mu, the transformation for dual vectors, we can take a look at the transformation rules for matrix representation. Recall that in a previous video, we stated this equation to be true. V twiddles transpose V equals an invariant. That means that if we transform V, nothing changes. In other words, V prime twiddles transpose V prime equals V twiddles transpose V. V transforms to V prime via the matrix lambda, as we've defined previously. And we're looking for this matrix that transforms V twiddles to V twiddles prime. I'll state that this matrix we're looking for is lambda inverse transpose. And here's why. Transposing this first quantity in parentheses yields v twiddles transpose lambda inverse lambda v. Lambda inverse times lambda is the identity, which is trivial and hardly ever written. This then gives us v twiddles transpose v, which is equal to the right side of the equation. This was a bit of a lengthy proof, but it leaves us with some very valuable skills. Given any transformation matrix lambda, we can use that matrix to transform both vectors and dual vectors from both unprimed to primed and from primed to unprimed systems via the following. Now that we've fleshed that out, transforming tensors is a very easy next step. All we need to do is apply a transformation for each individual index on the tensor. Let's take a look at this example. We want to transform the tensor T upper mu lower nu alpha to T upper mu prime lower nu prime alpha prime. Because we're transforming three indices, we'll need three different lambdas to act on the original tensor. We can fill in the indices knowing that mu, nu, and alpha must all be contracted indices. Thus, the first lambda should have an upper mu prime and a lower mu. The second lambda should have a lower nu prime and an upper nu, and the third lambda should have a lower alpha prime and an upper alpha. Thanks to the work we did previously, we already know the matrix forms of all these lambdas. We should take a minute here to address the metric, which is the exception to these rules. I mentioned in the last video that the components of the metric do not transform under isometries, 
and that still applies here. If lambda is an isometry of the space, we can say that g mu prime nu prime equals g mu nu. It can be a common misconception to take other properties of the metric and try to apply them to an arbitrary tensor. For example, in the last video, we said that the inverse of g lower mu nu is g upper mu nu. While this is always true for the metric, this is not necessarily true for any tensor. To say that t lower mu nu inverse equals t upper mu nu is generally not true. Let's do a fun thought experiment. You may have noticed that while we were flushing out these transformation rules, it seems that the tensor upper mu nu transforms exactly the same as two individual vectors, v mu v nu. So can we just represent any multi-index tensor as the product of several vectors and dual vectors? To answer this, let's think about components. In 3D, we can represent t mu nu as a 3 by 3 matrix. How many components does this representation have? The answer to this is 9. In 3D, t mu nu can have as many as 9 components because we represent it as a 3 by 3 matrix. Now think about v mu v nu still in 3D. How many components would this have? Well, v mu and v nu in three dimensions are both three component vectors. So v mu v nu can have up to six components. So it doesn't really seem like these two are very compatible. But wait, what if we demand that t mu nu is symmetric? In 3D, how many components would this have? Now, we see that if t mu nu is symmetric, it can only have up to six different components. So it seems like we can substitute one for the other as long as t mu nu is symmetric. Another way to think about this is as follows. Any two vectors, v mu and v nu, can be represented instead as a symmetric two-index tensor, or t mu nu. However, we can't always go the other way. Not every two-index tensor can be represented as two one-index tensors. We say generally that tensors are representations of transformations. What is and isn't a tensor may change in different spaces, since the transformation rules change. Take time, for example. In a 4D space-time, where we only concern ourselves with the rotation of spatial coordinates, time is a constant, or a zero-zero tensor. In other words, time doesn't change when we're rotating our x, y, and z axes. But in four-dimensional special relativity, we use Lorentz transformations, which mix space and time. Time now can change under transformations. So time is no longer a constant and thus no longer a tensor. In this space, time is a component of a four-vector, and that four-vector is a tensor. So the analysis of tensors goes well beyond the objects themselves, but also depends on the space in which we're working. In all of our examples, we've used what we call global or constant transformations, where the location of the object in space has no influence on how the object transforms. For example, we've looked at this rotation matrix, where we do the same rotation by the same angle at every point in space. But now imagine if we had some matrix where the angle by which you rotated had some x, y, and z dependence. We still have one matrix, but the theta that we use is now a function of our coordinates. Something like this is what we call a local transformation. It may be surprising that we can extend the definitions of invariants and tensors to local transformations, but it actually can be done. Doing so will lead us down the road to general relativity and will eventually even imply the existence of gravity. But for our purposes, we'll wrap things up here.